Howdy folks, welcome to the May edition of Cattle Trails Showcase. I'm Ron Wilson, Poet Lariat. Mighty glad to be your host. Today we're zooming to Texas to have an opportunity to learn about the Texas Historical Commission and see some really outstanding videos about the Chisholm Trail that we produced in Texas. We're also gonna hear from Texas Congressman Tracy May. So glad you're with us. The purpose of the Cattle Trails Showcase is to continually highlight the community's historical elements, museums, and other attractions along the Chisholm and the Western Cattle Trail. The showcase is brought to you by the International Chisholm Trail Association, of which Dennis Katzenmeyer is president, Michael Brower is vice president, uh, Nancy Lawrence is secretary, and Mary Lou Rivers is our treasurer, and Lonnie Stevens is our showcase chair. Before we go into our program today, I do want to provide an update on congressional legislation that would designate the Chisholm and Western Trails as National Historic Trails while protecting private property rights. Uh, earlier this year, Congressman Ron Estes introduced HR 247 to accomplish this purpose. But as I have been saying, the political dynamics now are not favorable to moving the legislation forward at this time. Um, on April 28, Congressman Estes sent the Natural Resources Committee a letter uh, which included the following statement. I'll read an excerpt. Unfortunately, the Biden administration's relentless pursuit of radical climate goals at the expense of hardworking Americans has given me great concern with further advancing my legislation. Time and time again, the president and his administration have egregiously ignored congressional intent and statutory requirements to protect the rights of landowners while pursuing this agenda. I believe the administration would ignore the private property protections included in HR 247. Therefore, I'm requesting the committee pause consideration of this legislation until Congress is assured that the rights of private property owners are respected and the administration will follow the rule of law and not simply ignore the laws they don't agree with. I look forward to working with you on this issue once those assurances are in place, close quote. So that was this uh, letter from Congressman Estes asking the committee to pause consideration of the legislation. Um, this week, I understand, Congressman Estes filed a statement uh, in the congressional record honoring the history of the Chisholm and the Western Trails. Um, and we've asked Congressman Tracy Mann of Kansas to issue a similar statement. So uh, they're, they're, our, our members of Congress are still supportive of the trails, but uh, the legislation is not in position to move forward at this time. I do want to uh, share my screen. And um, and we'll go to the uh, thought I had this up. Oh, there we go. We're going to try to show this video from Congressman Tracy Mann. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to commemorate the 150th anniversaries of the eloquent route of the Chisholm Trail and the Western Cattle Trail through Dodge City and beyond. The American cowboys who used these trails were the original pioneers who ventured west in search of new opportunities with nothing more than the horses, their dogs, their rope, and their bread. I grew up on a cattle operation in Corner, Kansas. There are more than 4.4 million cattle and calves on ranches and feed yards in our district, which means that plenty of cowboys call the big first home. Kansas has been the first frontier for cowboys since the 1860s, when cattle were driven from Texas to places like Abilene and Dodge City to be sold near the closest railroad. The cowboys would drive about 3,000 head of cattle on the 1,000 mile journey at a pace about 15 miles per day, so it took two months. They would look after their cattle 24 hours a day, sleeping under the stars and shifts in the land that would later become Oklahoma. By the late 1870s, so many cowboys were making this trek from Texas to Kansas that half a million head of cattle were being shipped out of Dodge City alone every year. These long drives disappeared at the end of the century but the modern cowboys of today still embody the courage, dedication, personal responsibility, and traditional methods from their pioneering history. Cowboys remain a constant in every change of work. They know how to break the force without breaking its spirit, and they put in a 40-hour work week by the time Wednesday morning rolls around. Cowboys know that they can't take short crests or do the bare minimum if they want to succeed. They are resourceful multicasters who do things the right way, which is often the hard way. And their reward for all the hard work isn't public accolades, but simply providing for their families, caring for their stock, and keeping America fed. It's exciting to see all the local celebration of Kansas history around these trips. 
I thank Dennis Katzenmeyer, President of the International Chisholm Trail Association, Michael Brower, President of the Western Cattle Trail Association, Ron Wilson, and many others for their dedication to preserving the history of these trails and the cowboys they use them. So that was Congressman Tracy Mann with his statement uh, in support of cowboys and the cattle trail history. And, uh, and Congressman Estes is making a similar statement in support of the cattle trails history. So uh, I'm very proud of our legislators for doing that. Uh, but as I say, the designation legislation is not in position to go forward at this time, which means that we're gonna go forward with our own efforts to continue to promote the cattle trail history as we're doing today. And that brings us to our program. So we'll turn to today's speaker and a huge thanks to to Steve Myers for uh, making it possible for to arrange Brad Patterson as our speaker. Uh, it turns out that this week is Texas Living History Week, so it's a perfect time to have Brad on today. Brad Patterson is a longtime staff member with the Texas Historical Commission, has been Director of Community Heritage, Devel Heritage Development since 2009. Uh, he's going to provide an overview of that office operations, and uh, among many other things, his uh, office has facilitated the Texas time travel videos on a variety of fronts, which are really outstanding. And we'll see some examples of that today. So with that, I'll turn the floor over to Brad Patterson. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I spoke to a version of this group in October of 2021. Um, and I must have done an, at least an okay job enough for you to invite me back or you forgot that I presented. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, it's good to see everybody again. And, uh, and I really do want to see the Chisholm Trail and the cattle trails in general advance, um, particularly because we've had success in some of the other national trails. Um, so I'm going to see if this will work as planned. Hopefully you're seeing my presentation. Let's like it. All right. I'm gonna to try to go through some of this as quickly as I can so we can see some of the videos uh, that we've got for this. So we're the State Historic Preservation Office for Texas, and that means we've got a bunch of regulatory and technical preservation assistance kinds of programs that we do with museums, individual property owners. We've got a lot of federal and state roles, which actually also means that we can't advocate at the state or federal level for any particular legislation. So we have to sit on the sidelines uh, when it comes to things like the, the national trail designations, uh, there's very little we can do uh, because of our legal situation at, at the state and federal. We've got grant programs of a variety of types uh, at the agency. Uh, we do historic sites management interpretation primarily through our state historic sites, which is actually a different part of the operation for me. Uh, and then community heritage development is my teams and our big programs are heritage tourism development and promotion, our main street program, our certified local governments that supports local preservation offices. Uh, and, and I'm also serve as the National Historic Trails Liaison between the Park Service and the nonprofits that are involved in the trails. Um, so I'm gonna start with a couple of things. Uh, so we don't have any of our sites that are actually on the historic Chisholm, Ch Chisholm, Chisholm Trail or the cattle trail in general, if we want to fight over the names or anything like that. Um, but we do, we are the managers of the official state of Texas Longhorn Herd, which has been bred uh, to preserve the purebred characteristics and historic characteristics of the Longhorns. We have between two and 400 head, I believe, in the herd. It's primarily based out of uh, Fort Griffin, uh, but we've got some grazing rights uh, about 20 miles from Fort Griffin as well, which is where the base of the herd is, and then in a few of the state parks. We're actually actively searching for uh, a permanent home for the herd. We need uh, 5, 000, 5, 4 to 5,000 acres to support the, the breeding portion of the herd, um, and we hope that we can find a place uh, that, of course, is suitable for grazing and that has the possibility for actually interpreting the herd and having visitation to the agricultural operations. Uh, but that's kind of a big ask. Um, so if anybody knows uh, four or 5,000 acres, we'd like to get out of the leased situation and actually have it be more stable. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm pretty sure we're gonna insist that it has to be in Texas. So that, that might shoot 
things down there. Um, we do have some state historic sites that are associated with cattle ranching uh, more generally. We've got the George and Marianne Goodnight Ranch up in the Panhandle, Fort Griffin that I just mentioned, um, Ful Fulton Mansion down on the coast. Uh, interestingly enough, the Fulton family was a ranching operation, uh, and that was before the cattle drives. So they were primarily using the cattle for the what we now think of as the byproducts for the bone and for uh, tallow and things like that. The meat was kind of secondary because there was no way to get the meat to market and that kind of thing. So um, I think there's even stories of them dumping the meat in the carcass into the gulf uh, because that wasn't the part that they, they needed. Uh, and then Presidio La Bahia, which uh, down in Goliad, which is a new site for us um, to take on the management interpretation. That's, of course, not really thought much about cattle, except that the missions were major agricultural operations with cattle and goats. Uh, and so Presidio La Bahia and the, the missions uh, across the street, well, across the highway now from that, those were major ranching operations, and all five of the, the five of the San Antonio missions, same same thing, had ranching operations outside of it. So, so in my division, um, what we do for heritage tourism and development and promotion, uh, we've got our trails program. We do heritage guides, TexasTimeTravel.com, and by the way, I put links in the chat for some of this to try to make it easy, or if you forget, uh, or for people watching later. Um, Texas Treasure Historic Businesses, that's just a recognition program we started uh, to recognize Texas owned businesses. Um, and we promote those, they cover all kinds of businesses, but we promote the ones that travelers might actually want to uh, engage with when they're, when they're out visiting heritage sites. So we give them extra attention. We do have two National Historic Trails currently in Texas, the Camino Real de Tierra Agentra on the west side that has about 12 miles in Texas. So we don't have a lot of engagement there, but there's some really important sites uh, in the El Paso area on that trail. And then Camino Real de los Tejas uh, that has thousands of miles in Texas. Uh, and we have a lot of engagement with that organization. Um, and I will say, although I think people here already know this, in our that trail was designated in 2008. Um, and so through various administrations, different leadership, I am not aware of a single property rights issue that has come up on, on either of the Caminos, but particularly on the De Los Tejas. Um, it, it, it's just really been a non-issue. I'm not saying people don't ask questions or get worried about it, but I mean, there's, there's nothing. Um, we even have a situation where an oil and gas company voluntarily, once they knew the site that they had under contract, they backed out uh, to allow the nonprofit through crowdsource funding to purchase the site to be able to preserve it. Um, and that was all voluntary. Um, and that site is under the nonprofit's ownership at, at this time. So it's been a great experience there. What do we do for the national trails? We're the point. Of, I'm the point of contact with the Park Service, serve as a liaison to the nonprofit board. I attend their board meetings, give advice. They may or may not listen. Uh, I coordinate the regulatory reviews if anything comes up. Occasionally it does. I smooth over consultations with our Department of Transportation and other state agencies. Uh, our agency will move forward with surveys, National Register nominations, things like that for sites on the national trails. Um, and again, those are actually those are all voluntary. Uh, and then we do cooperative agreements with the Park Service uh, that allow us to move money around. They can fund us to do certain projects that maybe they can't do. We use our nonprofit friends group for part of that. We've helped facilitate meetings, international meetings between Mexico, U.S. officials, uh, things like that. The Camino Real's got sites uh, across it. Um, we we do the signing. We're look. You're seeing stuff down on the border mostly, um, and then that the the tree photos on the upper left. That's the site that was actually preserved by the nonprofit in deep East Texas, and that's a that's one of the swales on the site. The actual path of the the route going through. There's actually five parallel swales. One would get money, so they'd move next next to it. We do have some sites of our own on the on the Camino Real. So Caddo Mounds uh, State Historic Site, Mission Dolores, those are and Presidio La Bahia are all historically related to the trail. 
uh, and then Casa Navarro and San Antonio Landmark Inn in Castroville are also uh, trail related resources. Uh, you're seeing Caddo Mounds in the shot. Um, our new museum that replaces a museum destroyed by tornadoes. It's actually a Caddo Cultural Center. It's nearing completion except for a glitch with the exhibit, so it's not open yet. Uh, and then the grass house in that image is the newly reconstructed, reconstructed grass house. The last version was destroyed by the tornado as well. So um, there are ceremonial and burial mounds on that site, uh, and the Camino Real goes right through, um, through the site and is interpreted. And we have a grant with a park service coming up in the next couple of years here to actually improve that trail, add some ADA accessibility and more interpretation. We do have a we do have a new trail, um, so not to make anybody jealous uh, or aggravated, uh, or that's not my purpose. <laughs> As you probably know, the Butterfield Overland Historic National Historic Trail was designated. It'll be several years before we start seeing this turn into anything. Uh, I believe it's been assigned to the Trails Office, the National Park Service, the same office that we work with on a frequent basis, uh, and for Texas, it's got a big stretch. Uh, through our state. So, and that does cross Fort Griffin, although the fort was not there at the time of the trail, it came shortly thereafter, uh, or the stagecoach route. Um, we have a few sites that are related to that. We do our Texas Heritage Trails program. Uh, that's the umbrella for a lot of this, but it's 10 nonprofits. Uh, you see the blue and white signs if you were out traveling Texas. Uh, you see those on the highways. They've been there since the 1960s uh, in cooperation with TxDOT. We co-opted that, and this is one of the ways that we do tourism promotion and tourism development with these 10 nonprofits. We had a new program coming up uh, that is a Heritage Tourism Initiative, uh, at least for us. It's a Museum on Main Street. It's a longstanding federal program with the Smithsonian. Uh, but basically, it's going to allow us to uh, select six rural communities, uh, and they're going to host a Smithsonian exhibit uh, in 2024 and 2025. Uh, but really, it, the exhibit is a means to an end. For us, it's going to be an opportunity to work with those small communities, build their capacity for, for this exhibit, but for future exhibits, get them collaborating with each other get some regional collaboration going um, so that they can do, uh, they can interpret their heritage better and get people into those communities. And, and the Smithsonian gives us a vehicle, a cache and an exhibit that they have ready that's already touring the country. Um, and it's a big deal to come to Texas now. Uh, we haven't had, they haven't had a lot of success uh, making inroads into Texas. So we're gonna try to change that. We do travel guides. Most of these, unfortunately, are out of print uh, at the moment, but we have money hopefully coming uh, in the legislative session. It's not quite signed yet, but we have money to do some reprints and some updates. These are our major guides. I think we're closer to 10 million now um, on, on the number of these guides that have been printed, but everything you see on the screen is out of, well, no, the Hispanic Texans is still in print uh, probably for another year. Uh, until we redo that. The others are out of print, but they're available in digital. And of course, in that collection is the Chisholm Trail Guide, uh, which we did in 2017, 2018. Uh, great guide, been very successful, uh, and it is out of print. But the good news is that that's the first one on our list to get reprinted because we don't have to make many changes to it. So we're in the process of getting a printer, uh, and we should have this one back in print sometime this fall. Uh, and we'll start redistributing that. Um, it is available as a digital download and it's available as a digital download in Spanish, fully translated as well. All right, so Texas Time Travel is our travel-oriented, heritage travel-oriented website. Uh, and it's got a lot of neat features. If you hadn't been there in the last uh, eight months or so, uh, it got a whole new overhaul, a whole new look. And uh, we're really excited about that. And it's we're seeing five times the usage that we were seeing uh, most recently with the old site. So it was a desperately needed refresh and redesign. So um, this is one of the splash screens. If you pull down the menu um, and I pointed out partly the plan your trip is one of the easiest ways. If you were to, to hit on that, you would get a link to go to the mobile tours. Uh, so it's the quickest way to get to the videos, which are available in a variety of different cha media channels. Uh, the site is completely optimized for mobile, and we're seeing about 60% of our usage is on mobile for the site, which is which is kind of where the industry is at the moment. 
So we do have some thematic ways that you can search. Uh, we've got a site here, the Cattle Trails and Cowboy Culture, uh, with a shot of the Outdoor Chisholm Trail Museum in Cleburne. I didn't fake that. That was that was that's what we have. Uh, you can see this is our this is our cowboy cultural attractions uh, that are on the map, um, and you can clearly see that there's what appear to be a Chisholm Trail related connection there going up that I-35 corridor spine, um, and then we have a scattering of sites uh, that are associated. These are all these are our sites, but also third party sites, mostly third party sites that we promote. We do have a Chisholm Trail landing page uh, within that with some some blog information, and then um, we do have sites that are specific to the Chisholm Trail. They were on that other map as well, um, but you can see the outline here. And then we had created a mobile tour, uh, which originally was a native app and a web app. We actually discontinued the native app, although a few people, including myself, still have it on phones. Uh, it technology just it could not keep up with a constant stream of changes on Google, that Google and Apple was doing and the user experience just was not what we felt was acceptable. Um, so the native app doesn't exist anymore unless you already had it downloaded, um, but all of the features have worked perfectly the entire time as a web app. Um, and so that's where we direct everybody now um, is to the web app. If you're using it on a mobile device and you allow it, it can still know where you are and it can tell you sites that are nearby. So it still has some of that integration. We've got uh, the Chisholm Trail. Basically, I think there's a hundred sites that we highlight uh, from on, along the whole length of the trail in Texas from down on the border all the way up, well, our southern border all the way up to our northern border. Uh, Waco Suspension Bridge is the one that the three shots on the left, the, the crossing before the bridge, the const bridge construction or early part of the bridge, and then the bridge in the last few years there in downtown Waco. So we've got videos and I'm gonna show you a few in a minute, um, but we've got eight base videos and then there's actually some additional ones. That's, we have 11 tours of different types on the site. Um, the Chisholm Trail is one of those, um, but it's the video content that's been really exciting and, and highly utilized on all the different channels. We push them out on Facebook as well. We push them, they're on our YouTube channel, not as easy to find there, but um, they're on those two as well. And so we get really good coverage out of them. One of the ones I'm gonna show you, we know we've had 800,000 views of uh, Los Vaqueros one, which is kind of one of our more popular for the whole agency. So the, the main videos we have, some of which I'm gonna show, uh, not as many, cause I'm gonna run out of time, but uh, so we've got uh, the Trail of Change Texas. We've got ones on pop culture. We've got some multi multicultural videos, uh, related videos. We talk about the cattle themselves on who's in the trail. Uh, we got a legacy of the Chisholm Trail, which is kind of our concluding video. Uh, we do dollars and cents. Um, we've got life on the trail. We look at the culinary legacy in some of these videos. And then um, we have got uh, about five videos that we've also done that are more contemporary, more first person. And I'm going to try to show you one of those, Los Volqueros. Uh, but we, I'd encourage you to look at some of the others. We've got Armando's Boots, uh, which is a family-owned operation down in Raymondville. Been been doing custom boots uh, for 50 years now, I think. Uh, we've got a really great video on chuck wagon cooking uh, done by Tom Perini of Perini Ranch and one of our commissioners. Um, we've got uh, Cowboys of Color Rodeo, which is a really cool, interesting video. Uh, we have one on the special range we call Special Rangers. It's on the uh, Southwest Texas and Southwestern Cattle Raisers Association. They're, they're peace officers that do all their investigations. Uh, we've got a video on them. Uh, and then we have one on the 1967 Chisholm Trail Rail Car Museum. Um, which I really wanted to show, but it's a little bit long and it's an oral history almost, so it bounces around a little bit. Um, but one of our commissioners, John Crane, uh, is sort of telling the story. When he was 21 or so, he was the person that rode with the car. Uh, so he's reminiscing um, and showing some of the artifacts and, and thinking back to that fabulous exhibit that traveled the rails 
to promote the anniversary in 1967. Okay, so now I'm gonna try to show a couple of videos before I run out of time. Um, so as, uh, as you do that, I was gonna let you know that we had John on a few months ago. Oh, cool. Which it's was a, really terrific. It's, I'd encourage you to look at the videos that we don't get to today. And then certainly we've got some fantastic videos on the other, uh, on the other tours that we have African American heritage, Hispanic heritage, German heritage, World War One, World War II, um, the Bankhead Highway, one of the only ones that's actually kind of a linear tour where you actually could go from one end to the other uh, along the historic Bankhead Highway. All right, so let me I'm going to show the first, which is kind of our introductory video, the actual content. I think everybody on this video, the, on this call already will know, um, but I, it's still kind of a good introduction that we created for the general public. Other states were carved or born. Texas grew from hide and horn. Berta Hart Nance, Texas poet. There he is, the cowboy, a silhouette against the setting sun, a shadow atop his horse, the hat, the boots, the trademark spurs, and there alongside standing low and strong amid the grass, the Texas Longhorn. For more than a century, through novels, paintings, songs, and Hollywood movies, this image of the cowboy, it's become part of us, our identity as Americans and as Texans. Born from the Spanish and Mexican vaquero tradition, the modern cowboy image was born here in the late 1800s, along a vast stretch of terrain known today as the Chisholm Trail. Between the 1860s and the 1880s, Texas cowboys took millions of cattle on a journey hundreds of miles, mostly to trailheads and waiting rail cars in Kansas to ship them back east to feed a growing America. The trail ride took them over the wide open Texas wilderness, across rushing rivers, and through unruly Indian territories, a rugged three-month trip. It meant big profits for Texas cattle barons, put food on the table for many a family, and paid for many a drink in the saloon. And then, the Chisholm Trail was history, the stuff of folk songs and tall tales. By the late 1880s, the trail had all but faded away, cut off by barbed wire fences, replaced by trails further west and rendered obsolete by the railroad. Today, people still argue over the Chisholm Trail's exact route and even who it's named after. It wasn't the only great cattle trail. There was the Shawnee before it and the Great Western after it but none captured our imagination like the Chisholm. In a way, the trail saved us. Texas was a destitute place after the Civil War, and the cattle drives gave us exactly the economic boon we needed. The economy of the Lone Star State was transformed, thanks to enterprising ranchers, nail-tough cowboys, and a whole lot of longhorns. So, saddle up. We're about to take a trail ride through history and meet the men and women who laid it all on the line to build a better life. Get ready to take a ride along an American legend, the one and only Chisholm Trail. All right, and I apologize to all you non-Texans. We're a little Texan, Texas-centric down here. I, most of us do know that the, the trail uh, has, I don't know, it had some, some importance in Oklahoma and Kansas, but we, we, get, a little, we get a little focused. All right, uh, next one I'm gonna show you is kind of to talk about the cattle themselves and the land.
the Longhorn, a beast built perfectly for the Texas terrain. Shoulders stacked with muscle, hooves designed for marathon drives, and those trademark horns up to seven feet across, enough to keep any predator away. For centuries, the Longhorn thrived where few other cattle breeds could have, the stifling coastal prairie of South Texas. Brought to North America by Spanish settlers, the Longhorns adapted over 300 years to be durable and dependable, growing fat on Texas grass. The famous cattleman Charles Goodnight said, As trail cattle, Longhorns equal has never been known, and the Texas Longhorn and the Chisholm Trail would make a perfect match. The Chisholm Trail was like a natural highway that allowed huge numbers of South Texas Longhorns to be transported to the waiting rail cars in Abilene, Kansas. Joseph McCoy, one of its early promoters, extolled the Chisholm's natural virtues over any other trail. It is more direct, has more prairie, less timber, more small streams and less large ones, and altogether, better grass and fewer flies. This was the open plains, and there were always risks. Longhorns were good swimmers, but crossing the Brazos or Red River always required extra attention. A rainy stretch or a sudden gully washer could make a river surge, putting the entire operation in danger. Then there was every cowboy's worst nightmare, the stampedes. Sometimes something as simple as a thunderclap could send 2,000 or more steers into a deadly panic. But barring the stampede or rare bandit attack, the vast majority of longhorns were delivered safely to market. Some herds arrived in Kansas after journeying nearly a thousand miles, fatter than when they'd left. And fat cattle meant fat profits. The Railheads in Abilene, Kansas. That was where Texas ranchers, cowboys, and drovers could turn cattle into cash. And lots of it. Droving crews would lead massive herds, often more than 2,000 longhorn in a single drive, sometimes more than a mile long. The drovers would take the cattle, worth just $4 a head in Texas, north to Abilene, and load them onto rail cars bound for Chicago or St. Louis, where they were valued 10 times higher. As rancher Bill Butler put it, the Chisholm Trail connected the $4 cow with the $40 market. This was big business, and every member of a cattle droving outfit had a specific position and role. The trail boss was the quarterback. He led the way, directed the team, and was always on the lookout for water and pasture. Cowhands rode on all sides and behind the herd, always looking to the boss for direction. The wrangler looked after the remuda, the herd of rested-up horses, which the cowboys swapped out regularly. Then there was the man in the chuck wagon, the cook, by some counts the MVP. If he was good, his pay was second only to the trail boss. The cowboys, though, were just one spoke on a complex wheel, along with ranchers, railroad owners, even politicians that made up the new beef economy. Destinies could be created along the Chisholm Trail. In 1870, Dan Wagner and his son Tom netted $55,000, huge money in those days, on their first drive up the trail. It was the seed of what would become one of Texas's richest cattle empires. But every drive was a gamble, and getting the cattle delivered didn't guarantee a profit. A market flooded with cattle could mean slim profits, or even losses for the rancher. And when the cowboys finally got the herd to Abilene, it meant one thing, payday. They got their hard-earned cash, usually around $30 a month. 
And in the saloons and brothels in town, there were plenty of folks willing to help them spend it. Some of my experiences were going hungry, getting wet and cold, riding sore-backed horses, going to sleep on herd and losing cattle, getting cussed by the boss, scouting for graybacks and trying the sick racket now and then to get a night's sleep, and other things too numerous to mention. The cowboy life meant long days in the saddle and short nights on hard ground. It's probably why most drovers were young. Many were in their 20s, but you might find them as young as 12 or 13. Imagine a teenager you know on a three-month trek with thousand-pound beasts over 600 miles of frontier. Every crew was hired by a trail boss. He provided the gear, the food, the horses, and the chuck wagon. Every drover brought the cowboy getup. The boots, wide-brimmed hat, a bandana to keep from breathing dust, leggings or chaps to protect legs from horns and brush, and of course, the spurs. A cowboy would tell you it was man's work, but some brave women made the long journey north. In the spring of 1871, Amanda Burks and her husband drove a thousand longhorns from their South Texas ranch to Abilene, Kansas. On this trip, said a newspaper account, she swam her horse across swollen streams, experienced a prairie fire, and witnessed numerous storms and stampedes of cattle. All Amanda Burks continued buying land and raising cattle for 50 years after her husband's death, and was dubbed Queen of the Old Trail Drivers. But life on the trail was tough, no matter who you were. Most cowboys had hung up their spurs by age 30, after no more than a drive or two. Thing was, though, once you had a taste of the open range, it was near impossible to go back to anything else. Cattleman Joe McCoy wrote, The life of the cowboy is one of considerable daily danger and excitement. It is hard and full of exposure, but is wild and free. And the young man who has long been a cowboy has but little taste for any other occupation. We all know what a real Texas cowboy looks like, or do we? The first Texas cowboys weren't cowboys at all. They were the vaqueros, Mexican and Spanish cattlemen, grandfathers of the modern cowboy. Any real cowboy history begins there in the 1500s when the Spanish arrived in Mexico. As the Spanish moved north into the area they called Tejas in the early 1700s, they brought their horses and longhorns with them. They established massive ranchos, and it was the vaqueros who kept them running. In the 1800s, American settlers poured into Texas after the Mexican-American War. Early ranchers like Mifflin Kennedy and Richard King sought out skilled vaqueros to teach them their centuries-old traditions of ranching. At the Bayi Ranch, dating back to a Spanish land grant of 1790, the cultures of Mexican vaqueros and the new American settlers began to coalesce. This fusion of old and new, of Spanish, Mexican, and European, ultimately came to be known as Texan. The Texas folklorist J. Frank Doby wrote, This coming together, not in blood, but in place and occupation, of this Anglo-American, this Spanish owner, and this Mexican vaquero, produced the Texas cowboy, a blend, a type, new to the world. Perhaps even less well-known was the black cowboy. Some historians say as many as one in four Texas cowboys were African-American. On the trails, highly skilled, all-black crews of drovers made the journey and later established black ranching communities, such as the Settlement, 
now part of Texas City in Galveston County. But history tends to remember those who had the power and forget those who didn't. When the Old Time Trail Drivers Association formed in 1915, African Americans and Hispanics were largely excluded. Though some are renowned, the mostly nameless thousands of cowboys of color were every bit Texas cowboys, even if they didn't make it into the history books. Somewhere around the 1600s, Spaniards came into Texas. They were excellent horsemen and developed a ranching industry. By 1830, there were some very well-established ranches. Uh, Alonso de Leon, Jose Antonio Navarro, Juan Seguin, Bernardo Gutierrez de Lara, uh, Jose de Escandon, and all these guys had some very, very large spreads that they handled with vaquero team. The vaqueros taught the Anglos about cowboys. When the Anglos came into Texas in 1830, they had those little British riding saddles, no saddle horn. They came in and they see these vaqueros that have their saddles, they have the tapaderas that cover their feet so they protect them from, from the brush. They had the chaps, the chivarras, the, to protect their legs. Vaqueros came from the word vaca, a Spanish word for cow. And the bandana was used not only to uh, keep you warm in winter around your neck, but to wipe down your sweat and sometimes your blood as well. A lot of people, they just call it a whip. You know, we, we call it chicote, it's a, it's a braided nylon or rawhide whip. We use a lot of that for cattle pin work. You, driving cows, you know, they get they get scared of the crack of the whip. Once you crack that whip, they start moving moving away from you. There are not very many people that use whips on horseback anymore. They have the two notches on top, the one notch on the side. That's that's a Renato Ramirez cow. We branded with a rocking R. That's a Renato Ramirez cow. We castrate calves, they gain weight faster once they're castrated, you know that they'll gain 100 pounds, 150 pounds a month. If you leave them as bulls, what happens is they just start, you know, messing around, jumping on each other, losing weight, running around, so that's why we do a lot of castration. After castrating those calves, we brought the mountain oysters to the grill and we cooked those. They're pretty much I guess from farm to table, what they say, these came from the pens to the grill. Uh, we just washed them down with a little water and they just grilled them as plain as you can see. The hot sauce, we roasted tomatoes, roasted peppers, and we just put them in that big uh, morcajete, which is a grinding uh, stone, and just, you know, grind it up. We had to make some adjustments because the first time was a little bit too spicy, too hot. So we, we calmed it down a little, added more tomatoes. We had a traditional carne guisada, which is a beef stew, charro beans, and we made some pan de campo, which is cowboy bread. And we, we cook them all in, uh, in cast iron. We do a lot of day work together, you know, and we have fun doing it. You know, he's my brother-in-law, so I mean, he needs help, he'll come help me, or I need help. He, you know, so it's back and forth, you know, and then our kids grow up doing it. That's why we really do it, it's more of a family deal. All right, I had two more I'd love to show for those who could stick around, but I know this is about where you guys usually stop. So I also wanted to see if there were any questions. Any questions for Brad? Brad, I tell you, those videos are extremely well done. 
Uh, and I, and I tip my hat to the state of Texas for producing super high quality videos. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I can't claim too much other than, I guess, big picture leader, leadership. I had a team. They've all retired on me, that particular team. Uh, but we hired a videographer with a lot of experience and most notably that really got us as an agency. We've used him a lot of different times. He, he just kind of knows what our messaging wants to be and everything else. Um, and then we had script writers. We did it as big packages. So we did all of our tours in kind of two different packages. We had different screenwriters for two halves, but we kept the videographer for the whole thing. Um, it, it, it wasn't cheap, uh, but I will say that um, one or more of the World War II videos, I think particularly one about a POW camp, um, that was submitted and, we, and the team that produced those did actually win a regional Emmy for those. Um, so we've obviously stolen a lot of inspiration from Ken Burns and folks like that in, in that. And then the, the more contemporary ones are really uh, quite cool too. And those actually, those, those tend to play a little better on the, um, on the channels. Our, our biggest one overall is German, German speaking Texans. Hmm. Texan. It's basically the German dialect in the hill country that has survived as its own unique German dialect. We did that for the German heritage. And that one has more than 8 million views, um, <laughs> some of which I think is international. Um, so I, I'm happy to show the last two uh, ones that I selected if folks want to. But if you can't or you need me to get off, uh, I'd understand. I, I I'd encourage anyone who can stay with us, hang with us, and and I'd love to see the videos. Show them. All right. It's about, I think combined, it's about five minutes more of the ones. And then there's additional ones that I wasn't going to attempt to show you. A story as big as the Chisholm Trail doesn't grow up overnight, no sir. We all have the images in our heads. The cowboys singing songs by the campfire, battles with Indians and outlaws, shootouts and shenanigans in the towns, wild poker games in the saloon, and that noble cowpoke on his horse, rugged, independent, honest as an arrow. The cattle drives are long gone, but these images remain. From books and paintings, to songs and Hollywood movies, they've inspired adventure and heroism, not only here in America, but the world over. Early portrayals of cowboys and dime novels depicted them as wild, violent rogues, not heroes. There was some truth in it, but Buffalo Bill Cody knew there was more to the story. In 1883, Cody, a former bison hunter, set out to paint the West in a more heroic light and make some money while he was at it. His Wild West shows featured brave cowboys riding and roping and saving damsels from Indians. The show delighted millions of spectators in America and even Europe and inspired the rodeo tradition that's still alive and kicking here. Songs of the cattle drive seeped into popular culture as well. Who among us can't whistle tunes like Get Along Little Dogies? and home on the range. We have Texan John Lomax to thank for that. Beginning in 1906, he collected and recorded many of the old trail songs. One ballad, The Old Chisholm Trail, sung later by Woody Guthrie and Tex Ritter, probably did more to spread the legend of the cattle trail than anything else. And then there were the movies. Hollywood fell in love with the cowboy and sold his story to a delighted public time and again. From the Great Train Robbery in 1903 to the handsome Gene Autry and Roy Rogers. And on TV, cattle drovers like Rowdy Yates, Gus McRae, and Woodrow Call rode into the living rooms of millions of children through shows like Rawhide, Bonanza, and later, Lonesome Dove. And here we are, more than a century later, and that image endures. The cowboy, see, embodied everything we admired as Americans. Rugged, honest, independent, he was who America wanted to be.
They say it was the largest man-made migration of animals in history. Up to 10 million longhorns thundering up the trail. In their wake, besides dust, entire industries and even towns sprung up to support life on the trail. In 1874, Joseph McCoy wrote, So many cattle have been driven over the trail in the last few years that a broad highway is tread out looking much like a national highway. So plain, a fool could not fail to keep in it. Twenty years later, McCoy would marvel at the cattle economy in Abilene, amounting to more than $3 million yearly. More than $85 million today. What began as a simple way to get a product to market became such a massive enterprise that it spun off dozens of other industries, creating a uniquely Texas culture. Several products were invented or improved upon to support the booming industry. Saddles designed with the long-distance drive in mind. The classic high-heeled leather boot adapted to endure the rigors of the trail. The emergence of less expensive hemp nautical ropes from back east, to name a few. The cattle themselves provided more than just beef. Horn made great chairs, combs and buttons. Soaps and candles were produced from the rendered cow fat, called tallow. And a cow's bones could be ground up to make a darn good fertilizer. Another product developed during this time actually led to the Chisholm Trail's undoing, barbed wire. A new fencing allowed for the first time Texas to be chopped up into private plots of land, closing the open range and shutting off the Chisholm Trail from the cattle drives forever. More than a century later, the legacy of cowboys and cattle drives still permeates Texas culture, not just in our rodeos and ranches, but in how we dress, what we eat, how we decorate our homes. Folks come from around the globe to experience a unique culture that was born from those legendary cattle drives. The Chisholm Trail it still excites us, long after the last Longhorn walked up the trail. Folks, how about a big round of applause for Brad and Texas Historical Commission? Uh, Brad, uh, to clarify, to access these outstanding videos, is the best process uh, Google to go through the Texas site or what? Um, the best process would be go to texastimetravel.com and then go to the mobile tours and select the Chisholm Trail Tour. That way they're all in one place and you get the other. There's some audio, there's some audio uh, entries on a lot of the cities that, that are narrated, but there's not video to go with them. Um, and so that's the easiest way to get them They're They are on our YouTube channel. Most of them are on our, on, have been sent out on Facebook, social media. Um, so they, they show up in a lot of different routes and that's partly how we get the traction, the mobile tour itself. Um, Although actually it gets decent traffic. It's it's not the main, it's not the main way. We've also embedded them where appropriate in locations within time travel. So if you were looking at a site for whatever reason and it had an association, we try to link to the particular particular video for that site. But the the tour section is the best place to see them all together. Um, if somebody wants to post them somewhere, or um, we've had a few videos used by museums, um, I mean, we can arrange most of those things. These have a lot of archival photographs from, as you could notice in the credits, tons of sources. Um, so I don't think that actually interferes in any way. We have permissions for all of those, but we'd look case by case and figure out how we could, could do that. Although if you're just posting and linking, uh, there's nothing to keep you from doing that. And a shout out to Steve Myers, uh, because he was actually one of the subject matter experts that we had when we started this whole process for the travel, for the guide, for the print guide, and then eventually for the videos. Um, so thank you, Steve. And, and thank you all for the hard work you do trying to promote this uh, throughout the country. Um, uh, still got tons of upward potential. Uh, I wish the politics wasn't getting in the in the way of a designation that it really isn't political. 
Well, thank you. Go ahead, Steve. Myers. I want to thank uh, you and the Texas Historic Commission for all the support that you give on the Texas history and the support you give to the county historic commissions here in the state of Texas. And uh, we applaud you for all the work and your group, what it has done, and look forward to more ventures here in Texas. Thank you, Brad. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you both. Outstanding. Lonnie, uh, looking forward, what do we have for our next month's Cattle Trail Showcase? Oh, I don't know. I'm still taking this one in. <laughs> well, we're going to travel to Oklahoma. We kind of try to go from state to state. And uh, we're going to go back to the Chisholm Trail Heritage Museum. And Ron and I, and Duncan, and Ron and I had the opportunity to present to them. And you know how paybacks are. So <laughs> Edie, Edie Stewart is going to be our presenter and talk about uh, famous Indian chiefs of Oklahoma. So we look forward to that. So that and will then, be, uh, go ahead. And then the next month, Where's Dennis? The He's next here. month, Dennis has got to get his presentation ready for Ellsworth. So, but I'll help you with it, Dennis. All right. <laughs> well, that wraps up our Cattle Trail Showcase for today. Be sure to join us for our next showcase. It would be the second Friday. So that would be June 9, 2023. So to close our program today, this is Ron Wilson, Paul Lariat saying, thanks for taking time to join us in this place and come on back next month for our Cattle Trail Showcase. Happy trails, everyone. Thank you, Brad. Steve. Thanks, Brad.